Okay, um, I, I made a long video, and I think I'll probably put that off on the side. People can watch it if they want to, but I want to talk to the people in the country about what we need to do in order to take, uh, to, to be prepared for this virus. I work as a Kroger employee, um, and I'm also going to say to Kroger that um, you need to be giving us face masks, because if you don't, um, I know in my in my area, um, I'm at 512 in South Lake, we don't have masks and because you're not providing it. And um, you need to provide us masks because um, if any of us contract this virus, it'll be about, it's like a four or five day gestation period in which we're not gonna be able to determine if we're sick and you're probably not gonna test us. And therefore we're probably gonna pass on that virus to about 400 people. And so in order to eliminate this and also to counteract the kind of the negative campaign that will come out when you try to take advantage of this for public relations sake, that you were there and Kroger answered the call and are to be revered as heroes, um, just keep in mind that they didn't give us masks. And if, if it turns up really bad in South Lake, uh, the customers need to know that because they didn't give the front end staff masks, it is not in their best interest to provide you with good quality products or services. This company does not care about us. I will say that plainly. And if they say, well, you just made our company bad, I'm gonna say also that the government has told all the stores that if they don't keep a staff of 20 or more people on, on call, then um, the government's going to probably come in and take over operations. And so the corporations are in fear for their lives in this country that um, the government's gonna socialize all the, um, all the private institutions. And socialization is required as a safety net for those people who are out of work, which is pretty much everybody in the country. So it is in the best interest of these corporations who in otherwise would be um, at a fiduciary responsibility to their creditors, treating their creditors well, they need to flip their, their priorities and look at their customers as more important than their creditors in this situation. The creditors really don't matter. In fact, the creditors are not gonna make any money because the stocks are gonna be so low now that people like me can go in and take in a bunch of stocks from Kroger and later on make, I, I have like $40,000, I could probably make about a good million off of this whole thing and just making it worse for you now by telling all of this stuff that you're doing to us, I could make more money by making it more negative for you. And so it's in my best interest and other people's best interest to point out the things that you're doing wrong. And this is one of those things. So the, Kroger does not care about its customers because it's not giving its employees face masks. If we are to ever get the virus, we don't want to pass it on to the customers. And it shouldn't be us, it shouldn't rely on, it shouldn't fall on us, it should fall on them to provide it to us, okay? And if they don't, then it is a negative, it's a big X on their record that they're not doing this for us. Um, and I'm also set, gonna say this to Kroger, I will, if you fire me over this, I'm gonna go to the union and we're gonna start a whole negative campaign towards you and we're gonna negotiate all sorts of stuff that we could get out of the contract like minimum wage of $12, which is the living wage. If you go to livingwage.mit.edu, you'll find out what the living wage is for any particular state in America. And I suggest all the European nations look and see what we're paying our people and what the living wage is before you send people over here to get jobs, okay? So that they will know what living expenses are like here and how that differs for the other countries, okay? So um, anyhow, put that on the side. Uh, what we need to do, be able to survive here, um, we need proper protection. We need to protect people in the community. We need to stop throwing out this public relations crap that is really just self-centered and not um, centric on the employees and providing them better things. We need to eliminate policies that are just going to make it harder for the employees to do their jobs. That's just going to make it harder for stuff that would probably benefit the, the customers, such as 
um, we have a lot of videos showing wine commercials nobody gives a shit about. And what they really need to be putting on there is like videos of Mr. Bean or puppies and kittens. The reason why is because when you're stressed in this, in this epidemic, if you're stressed, then your immune system turns off. And, and you're probably wondering an example of this. Um, the bacteria in your gut that produces ulcers, comes uh, it wreaks havoc whenever your immune system is off. And that happens when you're stressed. That's the reason why stress is, leads to ulcers. All the people in the medical community have known this for 30 years or more. And it came about after they learned, uh, they thought that the stress caused ulcers and they proved that it didn't. But then they found that there was some bacteria in the gut that was producing the ulcers and it was doing it because the stress was turning off the immune system. There's a guy by the name of Robert Sapolsky who's got a lot of research in stress and he's got a video up on uh, YouTube called uh, from National Geographic called Stress, the Portrait of a Killer, okay? You need to see that video, and it's not only him, it's several other doctors, and they do various sorts of tests um, in hierarchy, and, and he, they show the fact that alpha males in, in, um, in the wild, like in monkeys, tend to not have atherosclerosis in their veins and it matches the way people in hierarchies the people of CEOs and whatnot don't have don't tend to have um, bad health and the reason why is because they don't feel stressed they they take create policy and they drop it down to people at the bottom and those people are stressed and that's the reason why the health care premiums go up is that these people don't feel comfortable down there okay and the people at the top will never understand that because when they come to a store and they let it be known with trumpets and loud sounds that they're coming in, people act unnaturally so they never see the, what, their, what, their, um, what their policies are doing to the people at the bottom. They get a picture that's more favorable to them, what they would prefer to see, but that's because people are pretending to be, um, they're pretending to be what the people at the top want them to be and the people down there are in fear for their lives and for their jobs and because of all that extra stress it's going to make us employees at the bottom perfect petri dishes for this virus whenever it comes into play and uh, we're not only going to have ulcers but we're going to have this virus and we're going to be and we're going to be perfect petri dishes uh, petri dish is a is something you put an organism in and you watch it grow. You give it the perfect environment to grow and you see what it produces. But we will be like human petri dishes and we will be the perfect environment for this virus to grow and we will pass it on to everybody in the store and in the entire city. And what will Kroger say after this epidemic? Will they say we were there to help the people? They can't because there will be so much proof that they did it wrong that they will not be able to say anything and then there will be the unions coming in saying you did it wrong and then they'll put l lawsuits towards you and they'll get the government on their side and they will put all sorts of monetary penalties on you and the creditors will be mad at you and everybody will be mad at you because you did the wrong thing, okay? So, um, and if you fire me, then I'll say I'll just push it more in that direction because I love... I, I, I am one of the most vengeful people in the world whenever I know that there's injustice in the world. And I did this with um, Alias Wavefront whenever they wouldn't give me a license of Wavefront, so I pushed Blender 3D. And that's the reason why Blender 3D has like 3 million users, and there's only 15,000 licenses of Maya in the world, and they only count for a $100 million, uh, less than $100 million revenue of AutoCAD, is because they push somebody at the bottom uh, of somebody who could have benefit that they could have benefited from I created rise of the thorax that was selling wavefront software was not ask wavefront employees uh, was my software helping them in the early days to sell their wavefront software it, I think it was that's what I was hearing from SGI employees on the inside and so they thought my website was the wavefront site and that's just the kind of individual I am. I went and pushed the Blender community, and I was also one of the guys that tried to encourage Ton to give users more say in what goes into the software, um, to at least put, come up with a, 
a design document so that programmers, when they're clueless, could go and look at the design document and determine other kinds of features they could add to the software that would be beneficial to everyone. And so that was something I pushed in there. I was also involved in other things like Breakthrough, which was a, a, a program for um, OSHA, for NIOSH, through Gary Wood. I was the guy that came up with the idea for the tutorial. They originally wanted to do a flash-based tutorial and the, and the, re, the um, requirement for this flash-based tutorial was that it needed to run within the bandwidth of a modem and I found out I could do the same thing with a, um, with a screencast um, that was very carefully performed um, using delta compression inside of real video in the real video program, I could get it within the um, bandwidth of a modem and so that people could stream it to their modems over the internet back then. And so I also encouraged Gary to color code the interface so that if somebody was training a group of people on breakthroughs, say industrial hygienists, that he could look, they could look across the um, classroom and see where the user was with respect to the interface by just looking at which, how it was colored, how the how the uh, entry form was colored, and um, that was one idea that I had with the tutorial. The other thing is by making it a screencast, I was able to make the um, the cre the tutorial correct to the um, application, whereas if it was flash based, it would probably not be represent representative of the actual application. So people would be going into the program and not getting the necessary feedback in the flash program and um, it would not um, it would not reflect what was in the actual program. So it was best that it had it was the screencast, but back in those days they couldn't do screencast because modems were not fast enough to really put video. However with delta compressed solid color um, imagery um, with no dithering, you can get um, good compression. It's the same reason why GIFs, um, why cartoons are, are really well compressed with the GIF format is because GIF works really well with large areas of color, of solid single colors. Um, JPEG does best with, um, with um, gradients. It's really good with gradients and less with details. So if you have less details in your images with a lot of gradients and color, then JPEG does well. Uh, the more details you have in it, such as you would have with a cartoon, the it would actually increase the size of the file above what a GIF would do. And that's the reason why with cartoons you don't want to use JPEG, you want to use GIF. And it was also the same reason for this tutorial. So everything that I worked through, that I've worked through in the past, um, I haven't really been an, ex an insignificant contributor. I've just not have been done doing a lot of programming. I'm very selective on where I work and what I do and, and what I get involved with. And I probably just didn't take the right processes through my life to really be somebody who could be um, representative of somebody that, that could take more clout and, and getting into high position and, and talking about stuff. But I'm coming to the realization that the position I am now is probably the best position in this whole thing because I can, you know, it says in the Bible, people, I think this is what it says, it says people look for great, look in high places for greatness. They don't look in low places. And Jesus came from a low place. The, the shepherds that were tending to their flocks, Jews at that time didn't consider sh Jew, uh, shepherds to be of anything great. They considered them to be fairly filthy and disgusting humans because they had to look after sheep and the sheep had a limited, uh, uh, they had a limited eyesight. And that's the reason why it says that uh, it has the saying, a, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing is, is that sheep can't tell the difference. If a wolf was to come in sheep's clothing, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And so they, they just follow each other's butts and they easily get lost and the shepherds are having to tag team um the the they're having to tag team taking care of the sheep and um and they're getting one's getting sleep and the other one's looking that one goes to sleep the other one looks so they're kind of the same as these guys who drive out 18 wheelers 
and they're each one one's going to sleep while one's on the job driving the the uh, carriage and then when he goes off the other guy takes on so they can provide so they can provide products to the stores in this certain um, in this sort of catastrophe they there have people on the streets that are delivering the products that are also doing something that's kind of equivalent to what um, these shepherds were doing in Jesus's day um, they're tag teaming the process of making sure that the sheep don't get lost and um, so people understood it when it's they said the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want is they're thinking about these shepherds who are like really intent on keeping people together or keeping pe trying to keep people from getting lost or going off in different ways trying to bring them back okay and so there's a lot of imagery a lot of symbology we've lost over the years from you know people in religion that just don't understand things like uh, what uh, Ray Vanderlaan I think it was said that the reason why Jesus walked on the water was to prove to the Jews that the um, the inter that the depths of the lake that they feared that if you drowned in the lake you would enter hell he was basically saying to them um, I'm above hell uh, there's no way to enter hell and so if you watch Ray of Anderlon videos you'll learn that um, I don't the, the people who are in the Christian community um, I tend to wonder if they even think about stuff from their own religion like um, it says don't, don't hold any graven images between you know uh, of so what's the cross if you put the cross up is it a crutch are you saying you're a Christian you're part of the clique but if you're not walking the walk what does it matter so why even have the cross in the first place what is it there's that song that says how will they know we are Christians by our love by our love how do they know we're Christians by our love and so we we go and we go and say oh you guys are going to hell well what does it say about that you know it says who uh, uh, for any of these guys to lead some children away it's better to throw them in the sea with the millstone hung around their neck and that's basically what you're doing whenever you're going to say these guys are going to hell and um it's the same as what the Pharisees are. The Pharisees were like that. So basically, you could pretty much say anybody who says, and Pat Roberts said this, he said uh, anybody who's not voting for Trump is going to hell. We could take Pat Roberts of 700 Club and throw him in the Pharisees' camp. And it, what did Jesus say about the Pharisees? He said it will be better on the day for the Sodomites than it will be for the Pharisees. So Pat Roberts is now over there, and he should go back and say, I'm sorry for telling people they would go to hell for not for voting for Trump, and then try to take a better approach to dealing with things like that, not going up on TV, because every evangelist get, takes the risk of actually putting something in to the words of God and Jesus that's not there, or thoughts that, that, that wouldn't, they wouldn't be for. For instance, um, Jesus said to Peter, um, um, "Do not uh, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword." It is basically Jesus saying, "War is futile." So when we go and do something, we go to war with somebody, and we say that there's some Christian agenda behind it. We need to keep in mind that some of the stuff out there was caused by Christians. I mean, have you looked up on the Catholic Crusades? What they did in the Catholic Crusades? Read up on it. It may be the reason why in the Muslim uh, law there is a jihadist movement is to protect their their religion from what the Catholics did to the people in the various sorts of places by holding a, a sword to their throat and saying, do you believe Jesus is the Christ? See, religion should never be used to, to, to justify any kind of evil um, in any camp, Muslim or Christian. It should never be done, and we need to get rid of that. So there's all these unnecessary stresses in the world, all this social stress, all these uh, stresses that the corporations, uh, you know, the Republican Party, you got the fiscal conservatives, the religious conservatives. The religious conservatives, are they even following their own religion or even understanding it? And there are they marrying themselves to somebody who has greed at the uh, monetary greed at the center of their heart? And if they are, should they even be part of that party? Should they be 
should the uh, religious conservatives be with the liberal conservatives in a different camp and then making sure what they need to be doing in that camp rather than being married to the the democrats or republicans okay it's a just a different way of dealing with these things you can't take up a stance of um if it ain't broke don't fix it um because in cases like this where we got this big old viral outbreak um if we don't respond quickly to this we can't use conservative rhetoric to to protect ourselves we have to take a large fast response to this and that's what the liberals do they try to think up ways of fixing things that they can see is happening and you call them stupid and then you ask for us to be united and we're not going to be united because you just called us stupid you're out of the question we're not going to even agree with you you're in your own camp so you wanting that unification you're not going to get it it's the same thing that happens whenever two people talk of a, a, a different religions, like a Jewish person and a Muslim person talking over their differences. And you have that one crazy guy that comes up and it says, what you guys believe, that's all hogwash. Well, that, that rules you out, so there's no reason to listen to you. You'll never make an inroad with that because you're not willing to understand their different viewpoints and to see where they differ. Um, and, you know... Belief is how you describe the unknown. And, um, and scientists, I'm from Los Alamos. My dad was a nuclear physicist. And he's taught Sunday school for babies. Um, and, for six, and he also did a jail ministry at the same time for 16 years or even longer for the babies. And um, he's well known in the jail ministry there. We had a, we had a guy there who um, was a killer and one day um, we brought him the word and he misinterpreted it, that um, the word, um, something in it that he, he brought up this idea that uh, he didn't feel remorse for killing someone. That it was a reason why he was probably going to go to hell. And we told him, no, you can't go to hell, hell just because he didn't feel remorse. Um, uh, you know, just if you're not going to do it again, you understand that it was bad to do it in the first place. You know, it, you're OK. Just don't kill people, you know. And, um, but he was convinced the fact that he didn't feel remorse was a sign that he, um, was, that he was going to go to hell. And he got really scared that night and he died just from the stress. And he was in his thirties. He was thin. He didn't look like any preconditions. Uh, it didn't look like he did drugs or anything. He looked perf perfectly normal to me. I looked him straight in the eyes whenever he was saying this stuff to me. And he just would look really wild-eyed, like, you know, it was getting through to him, and he just couldn't take it. Uh, he, he, he was afraid for his life. Uh, he was having a spiritual awakening or something. I've had uh, experiences with this myself, and so I can kind of see where he's coming from. But he took it to heart, and um, the stress killed him in one night. So stress alone can kill you. So the thing with this virus is we need to avoid the stress, we need to, we, if we have any problems with people in religion, we need to um, let it be known that um, there's no reason why you can go to hell. Um, the only reason that would be with Christians, the only reason that would be is if you just chose not to believe, okay? That's the ultimate sin, is just choosing not to believe. Um, and believing means that you would go through and look at all of the writings and see how true it is and how it meets up with your kind of ethics, you know. And if it meets up kind of one to one, then um, they're then saying believe says something in your heart that you agree with the ethics and the stuff that's in the Bible, and you make the leap of faith to say that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is in the last name. What it is is it's a title and basically means that Jesus was God on earth. Now, the Jews don't believe that. They don't believe he's the Christ. So to, to go and spend, you say that you're a Christian, uh, or I mean, among Jews, they probably will not treat you as nicely as, as they tr treat each other, or they may do it anyhow. But the thing is, is they don't, uh, in Judaism, they don't, um, they don't identify Jesus as the Christ. They identify him as, um, as, as a rabbi, somebody who, who was a good teacher. 
Uh, and it's also, they, they even acknowledge him in the Muslim world as being a great teacher. Um, but they don't recognize him as being like Muhammad. And so that's like the major difference. And you don't want to stick up for and like put that in their face and say they're going to hell and anything like that. Because you could end up in the camp as the Pharisees, or you could be end up as the guy who brought who took children away, who would be better thrown in in the uh, lake with a millstone tied around his neck. So it's really bad for you to go and convert people based on stuff like that. And the people out there that feel felt like they were um, that they were um, judged by a Christian in that way. And, you know, if you were gay and they said that you're going to hell because God doesn't like gay people, that's wrong. Uh, the gay, my dad, I talked to my dad about that, and he said, um, the gays are kind of put in the same camp as the eunuchs were in the Christian Bible. So the eunuchs were, um, were people that were there, they didn't have any gonads, you know. So they, um, eunuchs were created in such a way, I mean, they weren't created, but the, the, um, say in a kingdom they would make somebody a eunuch so that they could tend to the females and they knew that they were not going to impregnate the females so uh, eunuch had a certain place that might be a place where you would put somebody who's gay they could be with the, the females and they wouldn't have to worry about the females getting impregnated so you could actually kind of just take the gay people and the eunuchs kind of put them in the same camp in the Bible and they'd fit in perfectly and there was a part, there was an area in the Bible where I guess Jesus came in contact with a eunuch and discussed to him the, the meaning of the certain things in the Bible, and then he disappeared whenever the eunuch got baptized. So um, that's where the gay people fed in into the Bible. And um, but it also says it'll be better on the day of judgment for the sodomites then it will be for the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are self-righteous. They're the people that say one thing and then do another. And that's the reason why Jesus was so mad at them. And you can put in that camp all self-righteous Christians, you know. So we have to be very careful in the way we treat people, and you can't say that somebody who's atheistic is not Christian. You have to treat them all like Christians. Because it is better to say you are and then not, uh, it's better for you to say you're not than later do. So if you're an atheist and become a Christian somewhere down the road, it's not a question, it's not, shouldn't be a question in your mind whether you, they became Christian. You just, just treat them like Christians by default and just forget that there's a difference there. Just treat them as a better human uh, uh, the way that you would want to treat them. And then um, also to, um, also to, um, uh, if you say you're Christian, then stick by it. But don't put the cross in front of people's faces. Keep in mind the cross was pretty much the ultimate form of Roman torture of a person. And are we just uh, reminding people that if they really want to torture us, they could use a cross? You know, that's just a, a talking point. And another thing is, is that I would say to the liberals that don't believe in, in Christianity, um, try to read our book too, you know, um, to some degree that would be a way of evangelizing, um, the Bible to them, but it would be also a way for them to keep us in our place when we get out of, um, when we start veering to something that, that is not uh, representative. They could use that as a point to like really put us in a corner, you know, so saying you're part of the Christian camp is kind of dangerous um, if you're not following it. And I'm not saying that like I'm a Christian. I am a Christian. I started out being Christian, but I, I, I'm i really kind of not sure how well I fit in myself. And so I'm very, I try to be careful these days about what I say about people who are non-Christian. I'm just saying that if you're Christian, um, you might want to get rid of the, the crosses, um, get rid of the shirts that say the certain things that people don't you know, saying Jesus is the lamb who died for me and all that stuff, that's not going to mean anything to anybody else. It's only going to mean something to a Christian. And um, even the Christians who say it, some of them don't even know what the meaning is either. You know, they don't know that the Jews had to sacrifice lambs as a covenant to God uh, to pay for their sins. They had to sacrifice lambs routinely. 
and and it, they had to sacrifice different animals according to their um, according to their income level, and the idea was to try to solidify in the mind of the Jews just how terrible their sin is to God, and um, so. Anyhow, and I've got I've got problems, and it's part of the reason why I don't really think that I can even represent myself as a Christian. Um, all I can say is that um, we need to be very careful about the way we treat people, especially through this epidemic. We can't say that that God did this to as judgment on any particular people. If I, if anything, this was about, I would say that it was about um, the stress that we put on each other. It's it's a sign of um, how people are treated, how people treat people badly, and how we treat animals badly, because these wet markets, what they were, were there these places out in China and various Asian countries, and it's probably there are things like that in other countries where they're trying to sell like, like wildcats, you know, that shouldn't be, or, or bobcats or something, you know, people that are taking wild animals and trying to turn them into domesticated uh uh, pets. Um, when they do that sort of thing, the people that are involved with the sort of thing will tell you is that they that uh, the people that try to capture these these um, wild cats will actually kill off a number of them just trying to get to something they can domesticate. And so the thing is, is that we're doing it too. It's not only in China; it's everywhere. It's anywhere that they're taking. Um, animals who are endangered or whatever, and they're selling them on some black market. And that's what these wet markets are. They're kind of black markets for all sorts of animals all over the globe. They put them in a room that's at a certain temperature. It's not, it's not comfortable for a number of the animals in there. And because it's the, there's a temperature stress there, and because there's a treatment stress, and that they're not getting the kind of food they want or the, the right quantities, and they're not getting the proper care, um, they are stressed in multiple ways, and that turns them into petri dishes for whatever organisms they brought with them. And the organism that that um, that does really well among those among those animals is going to become something like this virus, which is probably how it came about, was from bad treatment of animals in these wet markets. And what they're saying is, um, in 60 Minutes, Australia, they said that um, uh, these uh, that these wet markets were really kind of, um, that some of the animals were being sold for like $150 American. It isn't like um, people who, who are, um, who, who have very little money that are getting these animals. It's people who are rich that are getting these animals. And they're either, they're either taking them as pets or they're eating them as meat. But in any case, those animals don't belong there. And um, what's running the whole thing, according to 60 Minutes of Australia, is, um, is crime syndicates in, in China, but they're also doing them in Thailand and other Asian nations around. And it's because people want to have access to meats they shouldn't have access to. They're wanting to have uh, access to animals as pets that they shouldn't have access to. There's no standards in China for all sorts of things. There's no employment standards. Uh, they don't treat their own people well. They, they terrify their people. And this whole epidemic is going to give the people enough um, leverage and enough need to actually overthrow that government. And I know how to eliminate the Chinese government. It's pretty easy. All we have to do is collect all the spy resources, what we know about the Chinese government, all the people in the various positions uh, positions in the government, anybody who can step down that will help us to recognize the various parts of their government, uh, collect facial information, special information about those people and their interrelationships, and then we could threaten them by taking all that data and putting it out on the free market for anybody to see. Actually, not a market. It would be like on Wikipedia. We would put it on a wiki resource with any, like WikiLeaks, but make it accessible to everybody in the world. Now, they could do the same with us, but who's going to hate uh, hate them more? Uh, is it going, Are they going to hate us? Is, are we going to get treated badly? Um, as hatred for us, but I mean, the individuals that get taken out in our government 
um, who is going to do it, and they would have to determine um, that these people were criminal in entity. It would help us to find, through the transparency, find the people that don't belong in our own government, because we need transparency in this government. That's the only way we're going to get proper representation in our country. We need, but they need to do it in their country to determine which people are part of the crime that's in their government to get the ultimate transparency. You see, the thing is, is that when people who are in positions that are kind of, um, they're kind of, um, they got tenure or whatever, and, and they feel like they're protected, um, if all the information is known about them and all the people they're related to, they're in, in order to protect themselves from being taken out, by spies or whatever anybody wants to do to take them out, you know, just common citizens coming banding together to go and and obtain these people and uh, and do whatever they want to with them. Um, just the, from the terror of that, it's going to want them to step down and leave the government, or maybe we can have some sort of program ready to take in all of the various sorts of people in control of the Chinese government and put them in a controlled camp, kind of like a um, kind of a, a white collar uh, community of former leaders, you know, and so that they don't get treated better. So they have something they can go to and escape this environment that, um, that in two, two ways, one is putting them in control of a lot of people and, and they're doing really bad stuff. But the thing is, is if they'd step down, somebody else would step in their position, take over the post and do the exact same thing, we'd be talking about a different person. So the thing is, is that we need to provide an area where we can take in all this government people who would otherwise be taken out by what we need to use as a leveraging uh, puck or a, a um, chip on the table is that we have access to all the information about all the people in their government, they could say you're bluffing, and then we say, okay, uh, you want to see this? We'll show you some of it, and you go, uh-oh, and then they might step down, and if they don't, we'll just throw it out on WikiLeaks and let the world decide what they're going to do with them. And that's that's one way you can get rid of their government is just by putting the fear into them, and you know, hoping that we'll that pe people will be nice to them and let them get out of the organization because some of them got there without really knowing how bad it was going to get and how much they were probably leveraged in there by their own people, you know, kind of saying, if you don't go with us, we'll take it out on your family. You know, you don't know what kind of things are, are putting people into those political relationships. So we need to find some way of getting those people of dismantling that government in such a way that the Chinese people can pick proper people to take up positions so that we can produce a real democracy in China so that they can actually be kind of one-to-one -one with us because then we'd be doing the same thing in our nation and we'd be doing the same thing in every nation. The reason why the corporations don't pay taxes here in America is because they can always find some other, some other tax haven somewhere else to go to put all their money together and they don't have to pay the taxes over here. So the thing is, is in the entire world, we need to do this. We need to make sure there's nowhere they can hide. All the people of all the world needs to go and, and demand absolute transparency from all their governments in this, in this crisis. They need to do this because um, their life's on the lines in one respect. Um, they need to protect themselves in, and we need to come up with um, better healthcare informatics and ways of tracking pandemics and ways of being able to determine when things are being um, brought into the world that don't need to be there um, that are causing people to get ill and being able to respond to that quickly. We need to have standards throughout the whole world. It's not make America great again. That's not what we should be shooting for. It should be mega, make Earth great again, okay? Or you could say it in the context of the Christians, make Eden great again, okay? Because it's all started from Eden, right? And so we're trying to get back to that perfect garden. And um, we do that by trying to overcome our shame and trying to fix the problems that we have in our world. 
And so we're trying to make Eden great again, okay? That's what we need to be shooting for. And I don't want to be a ruler of any nation. I'm just here to just let you know that I have some information, I have some know-how, um, and you all guys, all you guys have information, you have things that you can share, and we can bring it all together and come to a good solution. Um, and I might just be a good consultant, but I don't want to be a ruler. I don't want to be a position like Trump. Um, I might want to consult with Trump and kind of help him make decisions, or maybe I work with other people who also know m about as much or more than I do, and we can make decisions. I, I would say that we should probably treat this in the way that the Mayo Clinic treats patients by having many different doctors who have various viewpoints coming together to determine how to treat each patient rather than relying on just one doctor to make a decision for a patient. That's not very responsible. So we need to do that with our own government. We need to, or any institution, we need to be dealing with it with multiple people of dis different diverse views. Keep in mind that when uh, Jesus picked his apostles, he picked 12 people, but he didn't pick 12 of the same people. He picked fishermen who are just like blue co just blue collar workers. You know, um, he, he would pick a, a guy who was in the government um, who was collecting taxes, but the government, but a government that the Jews didn't want, and it's a Roman government, Matthew is collecting taxes to pay soldiers to oppress the Jewish people. That's the reason why they didn't like Matthew. Um, and then they had a zealot, and then they had, you know, they had all these various sorts of guys that had different points of views. Some were down the road um, after Jesus got hanged and he came back from the dead. Another guy came in, and his name was uh, Saul, and he had originally been a Jew that had carried the cloaks of the Jews that had stoned Christians. And then he got, he turned around and he became a guy named Paul. And uh, Paul was different from all the other apostles because he kind of came in as a Roman citizen and he was well educated. And I would kind of hope that I'm kind of like Paul in a way because I'm educated. I've got a, a, I've got a degree and I know some things and I'm kind of learned and, and I watch a lot of documentaries and I'm very concerned and I try to put the puzzle together, try to make sense of everything. I try to try to step outside of the box. I kind of consider myself to be kind of a voice in the wild, um, kind of providing kind of things that I think probably should be answered, but not trying to be so much representative of the answer myself, just saying I can see these things and I'm wondering why these why people are not there to represent that. And so I'm putting this in there and I'm saying, we need to be respectful to each other. We need to treat people well. We need to pay them well. There's a part in the Bible that says, um, says um, don't muzzle the ox. There's a guy in a documentary with uh, Jamie Johnson called The 1% that Jamie Johnson gave a reference to. It was a guy that had this company running, which was kind of a um, kind of a um, uh, a wood shop of some sort, and he used the reference the uh, don't muzzle the oxen to mean that you provide uh, metrics for the employees to know how they uh, how they um, stand with respect to the success of the company, and that's not what muzzle the ox is about, and. I'm sure Jamie Johnson knew that, and that was the reason why he put the guy in the documentary, is it was kind of laughing at this guy because he, he's, he says he's Christian, but he doesn't even understand the idea of muzzle the ox. Uh, you don't muzzle it, why, what does muzzling ox mean? Um, if you're plowing out a field, or I mean, if you're, um, if you're doing a harvest, um, your ox are gonna be eating from your harvest as you're harvesting the grain. And so some farmers who are just a little bit evil would put a muzzle in the ox so the ox couldn't eat the grain as the, gra the ox is harvesting the field. And so the thing here is, is, that you, uh, is that a lot of corporations muzzle their employees. They don't give them, um, they don't give them a little bit of the spoils of what they do in the market. Um, they don't give them honorary, um, you know, for be, for doing good work. They don't give them little socks in the company. They don't, 
they don't reward the employees in any way, uh, such for maybe in my case, for working for five years, they'll give me a $20 reward. I've given more money to the people in my store than I've than Kroger has ever given them. I can guarantee that. And Kroger can go talk to them and we'll find out that I have given, say in one year, I gave about $1,000 worth in gift certificates to everybody in the store. And then the following year I did $600. But I would like to do more and I just feel like I'm not really there to to work as an employee. I'm there to change the culture in the same way that Jesus changed the culture, the Jewish culture, by changing the way people value people. And so this this whole epidemic is perfect for me because I can come out of the woodwork and kind of show kind of the person I am. And I'm not going to say I'm a perfect person. I'll, I'll tell you, I've said in previous videos, you can find out what my biggest sin is. And it is pretty major, but I'm not going to cover, I'm not going to pretend that I'm somebody I'm not. I'm just going to say that I believe that people should be treated better. And I think animals should be treated better. And we need to avoid stre stress in this situation. And the news organizations need to fess up and say, people stop watching us pick up your newspapers get your news from the newspapers don't watch tv because tv is not going to give you any better information than the newspapers and the newspapers you have are, are limited in what you're able to read and then you can't read anymore however for some people they're going to need news organizations because they don't have literacy we got a literacy epidemic in our country we need to be paying for public schools to treat people how to read. We need to be coming up with better metrics on how to determine if people are getting proper education. We need to be dealing with um, the communities where those educations are being given to make sure that those communities have, um, have a proper atmosphere in which people can, can go to school and that, that our tax dollars are going evenly across cities and not just to the places where there are rich people. That, that all needs to get fixed. And this, this epidemic is a perfect place to start doing that. And, and w whether we do good or bad, we can look back at this and see if we are doing any better or any worse. We can look before this epidemic to see what was happening what happened in the epidemic and come to realization if the things that came after this epidemic were any better than what came before. And we can use that as a way of judging how good we are as, as a country or as a state, as a country, as a world in the world. And we need to stop treating corporations like they were supposed to be long-term institutions. Corporations were not designed to last any length of time. They were designed to last, um, I mean, no length of time. They are designed to last like six months. Um, some of the first public works, like to, to um, build, say, the Brooklyn Bridge, um, were corporation, temporary corporations our government created. But they were not meant to last any length of time. And what we put into the incorporation is kind of a kind of a picture or portrait of the kind of the soul that the corporation is and in that one of the document uh, one of the documentaries painted a picture painted a picture that the modern corporation that the government has created is kind of a frankenstein's monster it's it's a psychopath according to the documentary called the corporation so watch that documentary. Now that people have enough time to watch anything they want, stop watching the news, watch good documentaries, learn something about your world that um, the news organizations are not telling you. I can also tell all the Fox people that are watching Fox, uh, if you really want to understand how Fox works, watch the documentary called Out Foxed. It's not really painting a picture of, it's not really saying that Fox is to blame only. CNN's also to blame. The problem there is cable news is the problem, is that you shouldn't be sitting there watching news all day thinking that you're going to get more information and better information all the time. That just doesn't happen. The best news sources are newspapers, and we're getting rid of those because people don't, they're, they're 
sucked up into this the wrong kind of news. They're not going out and researching all the stuff the news talk about. They're taking it to heart and thinking that it's the God honest truth. And the truth is, is that these organizations only tell you stuff you want to hear and anything that's outside of that realm, they won't give to you because if you did, you would change the channel. And one of the tools that Fox News uses is um, they use sensationalism. They use tabloid journalism to keep you watching if they ever get the idea that their ratings are going down and people are switching channels, they'll throw in some, they'll throw in some tabloid journalism where it just doesn't belong. And they'll, and according to Outfox, they'll use words like some people say to inject opinion where it doesn't belong. So people will hear some people say, and in their brain, it's kind of a subliminal thing saying that there are people out there saying that, but what they're really saying is we're gonna inject something here that doesn't belong here to make people think that there is something being said like this. So they can do, they can give a counter argument that doesn't have any basis in reality, okay? And then the people don't go to do the research and then they just believe all sorts of lies because uh, which uh, truth hurts. Everybody knows truth hurts, lies feel good. That's the reason why Trump gives little, what it, how he calls little lies, he calls them truthful hyperbola. Look in his book, The Art of the Deal, look in his book and um, look for truthful hyperbola. And that's the reason why in his building, he elevated the floor numbers by 10 so the people that lived on the first floor would be able to tell their friends, I live on the 11th floor. And they think, oh, you live at a significant floor inside of Trump Tower. No, he, they live on the first floor. They just didn't, Trump didn't want them to feel bad because they lived on the first floor. So he elevated the floor numbers. This is the guy who's in our government. And who's who's handling this situation? He just, uh, according to John Oliver, he recently told Modi, who is heading India, that Modi is the um, the father of India, and Indians don't believe that. They believe guys like Gandhi to be the father of India. Modi um, has a party that he's a part of. Uh, one of the parties that put him into power um, are purely in racist Indians. They see white people as inferior and black people as inferior, and they see the Indians as superior to both of them. And they and supposedly, according to John Oliver, um, Modi, um, this this uh, party that put Modi into power, um, uh, is identifying Hitler as somebody to be, you know, as as, as a good teacher of how to create racist. To, to push a racist agenda, okay? And um, it's nasty. If that's the truth, it's really nasty. We don't, we don't need to have anybody doing this because what is the bottom line of racism is ignorance. Um, what drives racism is ignorance. It's believing that you're better than you really are. And um, it's, it's, it's judgment, it's prejudice. And you can do it in all sorts of forms. Like you could do it like um, another form of prejudice is saying, oh, the liberals are complete idiots. That's prejudice. That's almost the same as racism. So if you're willing to take your viewpoint over anybody else's viewpoint and you're not willing to listen to other people, then you're practicing racism. Okay. So I'm going to cut this off here. And what you need to think about is the way you treat other people and the way you treat animals because... They're at the center of the reason why we have this problem. Um, the way they treated animals badly in these wet markets, which is bringing animals from various parts of the world to be in a place to be bought by rich people to, for meat or for to, as pets, such as you've probably heard people trying to domesticate wild cats. Um, to do that, some of these people that brought these wild cats in contact with rich people had to kill several wildcats just to get one that was that would be that they'd be able to dom domesticate. But even those cats can't really be domesticated, and you're taking a risk with them. But the thing is, is that there are people that are willing to go out and poach um, endangered species just so that they can make money off of that. That's greed, and um, I think this whole epidemic. I think it did come from God. 
it doesn't really make sense that it didn't because the RNA uh, that goes into this virus is very intricate and well thought out. It's got to come from God. And uh, I think the center of it is, is that you don't treat animals badly. And um, this is what happens whenever you bring a lot of animals from different environments together in the same place uh, and they become stressed, they become a petri dish for the worst organism that exists among them and that is what we're experiencing right now is probably a form of judgment on us by, uh, by God to say you don't treat animals badly and it's going to change the hierarchy and the political landscape across the entire globe to say that you also treat people well too because in the Bible, uh, the God of the Bible, our, the Christian God, says that um, you give people a sabbatical year, a whole year off um, with, with paid a paid year and you treat them, you make it so that they can live and, and treat each other nicely and get educated and do the things necessary so that they can be more productive in the year following that. And because of all the greed that we have in our world, um, it's going to stress people out because they're afraid for their jobs, they're uh, afraid for their security, and as a result of that, their immune system is going to be off and it's going to make them a perfect Petri dish for this terrible thing that just got, re uh, just got brought into the into the environment and those who are religious need to see who their real friends are just by seeing how the corporations and governments in the various parts of the world are treating them and if they're treating them like they are and and the Kroger's treating us employees by not giving us face masks they don't really care about um their um about the consumers i can even give you an example of what they tell us as they say you need to treat your customers as a as as very well, you know, you need to give them a lot of respect. And I would say, okay, um, hey, why don't you go to 7-Eleven, get the $7 pizza. You get a full pizza, they can cook it in two minutes. It's really good. You can have a cheese, you can have a pepperoni, you can have a meat lover's pizza. And then the upper manager will say, why did you say that? It'll take all that business away from us. And I'll say, where is your intent to treat people better? Is uh, treating the consumer better? Is it so that they will buy your products or is it to increase the to to increase the better ecosystem ecosystem of all the various businesses around you that have to put up with your crap of all these little cleaning wipes that 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 um litter the parking lot and they have to deal with that and they don't get any benefit from you so why don't we just give our consumers over to them so that they get some benefit monetarily and just the fact that they will probably argue in their favor is proof that we have the wrong people running in Kroger we have the wrong management we need to get rid of a lot of that management we need to go through and make sure that they have proper credentials you know, some of them probably have lied about their credentials. And so we could get some different management. We could even discuss a better contract about how to treat employees. We need to discuss um, what kind of pay the employees should get. I'd say about 12, 11 to $12 an hour would be a good living wage. Um, they need to get good health insurance. Uh, and the way that health insurance needs to work, we need to to socialize the healthcare industry so we can uh, fix health, healthcare informatics problems of uh, systems working together. And I'll have that in another video that I've already done. And you can look at that one. And also that we need to fix the insurance companies so that they're not taking advantage of people. I don't see any reason why we even need insurance companies in the first place because it's all mathematics and we could probably eliminate a lot of that with artificial intelligence. We could probably design artificial intelligence algorithms to do all of the decision making that insurance companies do and uh, all the probability statistics. That does a lot of people out of work, but maybe it would be better to have those people elsewhere anyhow. So I think that's my video. I'll do more in the future, but I see myself more as a kind of a free consultant. I consider myself to be kind of a socialist and um, I would hope in the future that people could give me a little bit more money so that I could uh, guarantee my survival and that people wouldn't come out of the woodwork to take my life. But I don't really have so much of a problem if 
if it really is God's will that I be here, and if God wants to take me out, I hope that that it's good, you know, what comes as a result of this. But I'm really, I'm really kind of interested in in us treating each other better and getting eliminating a lot of the stress so that we're not sick all the time, so that we're not having uh, we're not waking up a lot in the middle of the night that we're able to treat our children that we're able to take our children to church that we're able to have the proper morality in our country that people are not uh, that the people that are in church that their children are not arriving at a kind of relativistic morality where you're defining morality your truth based upon your environment because that can produce wars if you have a community that develops its truth based on the people around it and they come in contact with another community that grew up in a different way there will be warring there will be um there will be conflict and um the thing about being christian is is that a lot of the christians in the world can can coexist it's easy for them to coexist and if they're in support of all of the various different religions and people that are there, if they treat them as friends, those people will probably become Christian. But you have to treat people nicely, and you can't be pushing your religion down their throat. Uh, it, when I talk about Christians, I'm really talking to Christians. I'm not talking to people who are non-Christian. That's a different matter. That's between God and, and them. That's It's not for us to decide what, who are going to be Christians. It's for them to decide if they want to be Christians. If they If they're if it's aligned with what they want to do, it's it's up to God to to kind of form them into becoming Christians. We it's not important for us to make everybody Christians or to force our morality in the way we see things on other people, other than just to treat people better. You know the way we would have ourselves treated. And the and when it says to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, people think that is an emotion, and it's not. It's it's um, there's a part where um, Jesus is in seeing a bunch of people and somebody comes out and says, your mother and your brother are outside Jesus. And Jesus says, uh, who are my mothers and my brothers uh, and my sisters, but those who do God's will, my father's will. Those are my brothers, my brothers and my sisters. And what he was really saying was he was saying that um, it's, it's those people, the people who do God's will, the people that, um, identify the things that God cares about, those are the people that love God. If you don't know what God loves, you can't love God, is what he was really saying. And so when you say you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, um, part of that is treating people better, and the other part of that is understanding how uh, how God values the world, how it, God values people, and to understand all aspects of that, to know about the sabbatical days, what the purpose of that was, is to treat people better on a sabbatical day and a sabbatical year where a whole nation would just not work for a whole year. Otherwise, people would, could be stoned. What it was, the purpose of the stoning was the same kind of idea of why you would take the life of a lamb to cover your sins, is to give people an idea to, to reinforce the way God sees the importance of of how you treat people and how you how you treat sin, okay, and to see that sin is not something you just do lightly. Um, but I'm not going to say that I'm perfect. I'm just going to say that um, that that's what that's all about, and that when we put on when people put on the cross, um, uh, that they don't they don't push it in front of people that they actually try to be friends with people. And if the people really push and say, well, um, what is it you believe? And you, Cause you seem like a better person, then you can bring Christ to them, but don't push it on them right on the get go. Just, you know, it's not important. Uh, it's more important to see everybody as potentially Christians and then, you know, just be friendly. Just try not to be like, somebody who's hypocritical like I am right now. I'm kind of hypocritical myself, but I'm just kind of pushing it out there. Kind of the, just let you know that we need to, um, we need to rethink this world. And, um, but it, it's not like it's going to get fixed. It's probably, 
is probably going to be okay for 50 years, then we will die and our children will take it on and they may not respect the things that we respect. And so it's not like the whole world's going to get fixed forever. It's probably only if we'll have this catastrophe and they'll have a catastrophe in their time and they will be looking to the to the previous times to see what people did previously and to see if there's any differences between us and them. So what we do now that would be good for the world and for each other is going to affect how they, uh, how they measure themselves up in the future. So it's important that we have proper recordings and proper information. Um, I'm a big proponent of um, same thing called ver VR video and Oculus goes that um, collecting video by this standard, uh, Hollywood's not going to be interested in this stuff. And the reason why is because you can't use a telephoto lens and stereo video because it ruins the dimensions. But, um, and so this is just a side thing. I was just wanting to describe VR is not uh, your enemy. VR is fine because there are certain cases where people will need virtual reality. For instance, people, women that have been raped, will prefer to meet in VR because no man can can make them vulnerable in that situation. They can be in their own house. They don't have to assume their real name. And they can meet with other women who have been raped and talk about cases where they might put in place laws in the government to help protect people who get raped and and improve the law there. And they can do that in VR pretty, pretty well. Um, people who are in the gay community can also meet in VR and they don't have to disclose their own identities. They can either disclose it or not and they'll be in their own pro protective environment wherever they are and if there are any objectors that it, um, in alt space VR you can basically turn a person off and no matter what they do you can't see it and they may be talking to other people but you'll say oh is that guy still there? Well I, I blocked them all together. And, uh, and then those guys might block him and then that guy goes around and, and nobody will talk to him, you know? And so that's one way you deal with people who in VR, that's how you deal with people you don't want to see, um, who might be toxic to the entire social atmosphere. And that's something you couldn't do in real life, but you can do it in VR. Um, VR is a great place for researchers to meet whenever they don't have enough time to go out and, uh, organize, um, a, classroom where they're going to teach people or a symposium or something where they're going to show people what they're working on um they can do that really quick in alt space vr which is owned by microsoft um and it's a great place where kids can come in and start socializing with adults uh if the kids use a cell phone and it uses a vr uh like one of those little cases that you put your cell phone in, keep in mind if they're using that, they can't get into their chat system. So they can't get the phone out and chat with their friends. It forces them to be sociable with other people. And so VR is v valuable in that area. And so it's really kind of pretty good, especially in this situation where people are, are um, stuck in their homes. Um, the killer app for VR is called Meditation. You can use this. You um, There's a guy on YouTube who has two minutes of video with monarch butterflies flying over you. And you go into the environment with your VR headset and you feel like you're there. And you can see, even though the resolution is not good enough to actually see um, really dot dotted monarchs, you can see them flying off, you know, like 100 feet above you. You can tell you're they're there because you, you can see kind of a, a remnant of their of their pixel, you know, but then once fly past your face and you can sit there and, and get the kind of relief you would get if you were sitting out in, in, uh, a environment in Mexico watching monarch butterflies. And what the guys who go out and do this stuff need to do is rather than just taking one two minute video, they need to take hour long ones in these environments and sell them off on the market for like five dollars they could make some good money in that just going to some environment that that um is is nice and then videotaping it with one of these cameras and then putting that stuff say on our youtube and um getting either money from advertisement or asking youtube to be able to charge for the video for like you know 
an hour worth of that video or just doing it for free. And the thing is, is then executives who are in the middle of the city that don't have enough time to go out to the countryside because they have to do certain kind of work, they can get into the VR headset for an hour, completely unwind, get rid of that negative stress. Their immune system comes back online. They feel good and they can continue their work. So VR is not something to be afraid of. It is going to be the future for communication. Photojournalists need to have these things. People who are pushing social change need to have these things. We need to all be using this to kind of give people uh, in completely immersive experiences of what it's like in the world, what people are experiencing, not these little postage stamps that sit on our wall that give us a bunch of different points of view, but um, are disorienting. And these things are completely orienting. You put someone there and they can look anywhere in the view and there's there's ones of these that are stereo but they're 360 and you can you can get a swivel chair and you can go and see what was recorded behind um the the people in the front and there's all sorts of different kinds of entertainment that you can do like there's this um there's this um Cirque du Soleil they got a five dollar app on the Oculus Go store where you get about an hour of performance, 15 minutes for different sets of performance. They got guys that are working with swords that are doing kinds of um, martial arts stuff. They got one where there's some people doing organize, doing um, doing choreographed water um, dances. They've got a guy who's a, um, a contortionist, a really good contortionist. They've got ones where all of the a community of performers come together and they perform all around you. And so they got all this stuff in an hour for about $5 and it feels like a really real experience. So like you're really there rather than being off on the sidelines, looking at the, the circus, you're in the circus looking at all of these performers that are looking at you like you're the center of attention. And it's a different kind of art form, a different kind of performance art. And it's going to need a, a different kind of language and it's not something that Hollywood is going to run after because they can't they can't do all the things they can do with a Hollywood movie like they can't use computer graphics much they can't edit the film very much because you can discern that you can't use body doubles you can't use stunt doubles you can't use wires you can't very easily remove content from the the film footage because people can discern that with their brain because they got you got stereo video and you can and you won't there's nowhere you can hide if it's a 360 stereo video there's nowhere where to hide the camera crew um, the performers are probably going to be the only people there there won't be a cameraman at all and so it'll be like um, they're performing on stage and so people that could perform by themselves are actually going to be more important in this art form than than um, movie studios. Um, I, th I had heard that Tom Cruise tried to do something with this, and he had to be his own stuntman to do it. And I think it's a, if it puts the fear in him um, if he can ever get into VR at all, because um, it can't. It's very hard to to manipulate um, this this medium. But it would be great for photojournalists, say people that are there, and they shake the hand of the president, and they ask him a question, and he blurts something off. If you can hear it in stereo audio, and you can see his face in stereo video, whatever he does with his hands, he can't hide. We can see it all. We can even tell what kind of shoes he's wearing. Um, all that stuff can't be hidden. All it takes is a photojournalist to put this on a hat and have it recording, and when you come in contact with the people, either they see it or they don't, but they have to come to the realization that if the photojournalists have access to these things, that um, they're probably using them and that they need to be a little bit more concerned about what they say and what they do to people. And it, it, will, it will have also an effect on the, um, the, the um, law enforcement if people have lots of these, it'll, it will really affect everybody in the world who has a position where they have to be responsible for people if they're not treating them nicely. 
all anybody has to do is put on their VR headset and see the environment, immersed in the environment in which this person was treating someone and they can make a better decision based on with their own eyes in this environment, knowing that it can't be easily edited, that it'll make it very difficult for, um, for misinformation and, and there will be less of the, the case that people lost that even the Trump puts forward is, is that it's all lies. And, um, I can talk about different ways why it might actually be lies, but not, um, the news organizations should not have the interest of pushing forth things that are lies unless they are, they're married to uh, tabloid journalism, which Fox is, um, you don't want to have tabloid journalism mixed with news. It's not good because um, tabloid journalism is is um, mostly deceitful. And so news should really have a level and standard. They should have whistleblowers that can determine whether or not the news, the journalists are, um, are well licensed that they're going to provide truthful information. And if they provide a lot of bad information, then they will lose their license. So we would have um, their journalists, journalists that go out that are independents that would go out and look for stories. And then they'll go and try to sell those stories to the news agencies. And they, they try to leverage them that nobody has access to this information or to this news topic. And they are providing them a special deal and then the news organization will take them in and put their story up. But if there, there, there could be a lot of these guys that are doing this, but are not, um, are not up to snuff. And that would permit, um, the news organization to put something up that might actually be uh, considered to be a lie. And, um, I think I recall that the whole Iraq war was justified on a, informant that Donald Rumsfeld had and it was just one guy and later out we found that he lied that he didn't know if uh, Sodom had uh, weapons of mass destruction and we justified a whole war on one informant that Donald Rumsfeld had you know I think that's really nasty and we need to have better standards for how we get information and how we justify our actions we need to be predator prepared. They weren't better prepared for the Iraq war. They didn't even have uh, Iraqi translators. They didn't even know what the game plan was going to be coming into the city, how they were going to uh, protect the various in, uh, the various sorts of museums that were there, if they were going to prevent um, people in the havoc and the right of the situation to, to go into museums and steal artifacts. A lot of that was going on when we came into the into Iraq, and it displaced a lot of families, and some of them who were Christian. A three percent of Iraq was Christian before we ever got in the state. And the reason why Sodom never um, never messed with them is because they weren't political. And so, our our country people just have these great intentions of going in and doing certain things and doing certain wars. And they don't even look at what Jesus had to say about wars, that it's futile. Jesus was never for war and he was not really for money. Money is what did him in. The Pharisees paid Judas Iscariot to hand Jesus over for money. And Judas Iscariot, the whole time he was with the apostles, was only thinking about himself and the money that he loved. And so, um, in there, in every case where Jesus ever come in contact, where the money was getting in the way, he overthrow the, the, the tables of the money changers. And, you know, he just, he didn't really respect money and God doesn't respect money. Uh, yeah, those people that believe in the prosperity prayer, keep in mind, why would God give you money by taking it away from somebody else? Even if he was to change the, um, if he was to, to um, increase the inflation to give you money, you see, to print more money to give you money, uh, that's, that's socialism. And so if you, believe, if you don't believe in socialism, but you believe in the prosperity prayer, you're doing socialism. It is socialism. And it's not that socialism is wrong. It's that your perspective is wrong, okay? 
And so socialism's okay. I, the way I consider it is socialism and capitalism are the sodium and the chloride by themselves. Uh, sodium by sodium by itself, sodium is a explosive metal. They throw it in water, it explodes. Uh, chlorine gas could kill an entire population of a city. This is one of the scenarios that the government has is if a terrorist went and took out a tanker on a train uh, line that had chlorine gas on it in the middle of a city, it could kill everybody in the city. You put the two together and they make salt. So sodium, the extreme form of socialism, is what we know is that you take away money from people and give it to other people or you put give it to the government and uh, so you're distributing the wealth. It's kind of Robin Hood to everybody, but it it uh, doesn't permit a lot of individuality. It doesn't pay people back for innovation or for bringing good things to the world. And that's important in capitalism. That's what's important in capitalism. Socialism is against that. The good parts of socialism is it creates a, it creates a standard of living. It tries to create... Um, like laws and things that protect people and protect the environment and things. And it creates a, um, a safety net for people whenever they're out of work so that they can get back on their feet again. And um, also we need transparency forever to do socialism. Same with capitalism. There needs to be transparency to see what companies are doing and how they're making money and things like that when they're in our country and that they're paying taxes. Um, so that we can support people whenever they're out of work. Um, but the, the extreme form of capitalism, which most people don't seem to know anything about, that is really bad. It's called the company town. If you look up the Maitwan conflict that occurred back in, I think it was the 1800s or, or, um, or, the, or early 1900s. I don't remember when it was. I remember seeing the movie. I think it had James Earl Jones in it. And it talked about a company town where people worked for a company, but then they, where did they spend their money? They spent it at the company store, and the company could adjust the prices at the store and pay people less and basically put people in dire straits. And so I put people in a rock and a hard place, and um, they tried to, I think they tried to create a union. And that was the way to solve that problem was to get some way of leveraging against the company for better wages and tr treatment so that people could exist in that environment. There, there are company towns in China and that this is called campuses like Best Buy will have a campus where they'll produce items that would be sold at Best Buy. But where are these people going to spend the money they get from Best Buy? Probably at a Best Buy store. And that's a company town, and that's dangerous because it's just like Walmart. People who work at Walmart, where are they going to spend their money at Walmart? And because the, there are all the other mom and pops that would be around Walmart, they don't respect those. They don't. They they don't let their customers see those places. So those places die off, and you, the only place you're left to 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 um, buy stuff from is Walmart. So you work at Walmart, you buy at Walmart. You're in a company town. You're in the extreme worst case scenario of a capitalistic system, one where there is no fair trade, or no no uh, fair market, um, where um, the people that provide good services can exist because there is one monopoly, one monopolistic organization that's controlling everything. And um, we need to eliminate that in our all the companies that are in not only our country, but we need to get all the other countries to agree that they're not going to have it there so that these corporations have nowhere to hide. Okay. So we need to change it. So the, the way the corporations are run, the way that the laws protect us and protect them, that um, it's fair and creates a free, a uh, free and fair market. And that, that we can that everybody can collect taxes on them when the corporations are in their in their ballpark so that they can't go and hide off in some other country without paying those country the taxes that um that those people deserve to have that corporation there and if they hide there then we can pursue them there by having lawyers on either side 
um, meet them at either end and, and embrace and say, you know, you can't do this. So I'm just saying that this is what we need to, this is what this whole video is about, was to also, it was to fix a lot of problems, but also to point out that in order for us to be prepared for this virus, for our immune systems to be online, because if, uh, if you're stressed, your immune system goes offline. Look up Robert Sapolsky. He'll talk about this stuff. He's got a documentary on, on YouTube, and it's called Stress, the Portrait of a Killer. And look it up. Um, it's a good documentary. And it will talk about all the things that stress do to us at, before this outbreak. And, I mean, it, it doesn't talk about COVID at all. It just talks about stress and what it does to people all around the world. And um, there are other documentaries out there you could you could watch. You could watch the um, the high the high cost of low price, which is about Walmart. You could look up Food Incorporated. You could look up Charity Incorporated, which talks about how charities work in other countries and that they don't tend to actually um, go to the benefit of the people in the countries. That there's things that, like for instance, uh, when we um, when we adopt children in other countries, we assume they come from foster um, foster situations that they are that they are actually um, they're actually um, uh, you know they they don't have any parents. But the truth of the matter is, in some countries, they do have parents. It's just that parents care so much for their children, they're willing to let them go to be adopted by. Americans and whatnot in other countries. And so you have to make sure that the children don't have parents before you adopt them because it can create some kind of unnatural relationships where the where you get a somebody from another country, a child, and they won't agree that the parent that adopted them as their parents. They know that isn't their parents, that their parents are back in the original country where they came from. And I think this is talked about in Charity Inc. in that um, in that um, documentary. But we need to be seeing more documentaries, and we need to stop saying, "Well, the liberals don't know anything," and then just hanging on to to books and document documentaries and things that agree with conservative viewpoints. Keep in mind, the Republican Party is made up of two camps that really would have had nothing to do with each other. I would call it a shotgun wedding that was necessary to get conservative agenda pushed through in our government. The, the religious conservatives and the fiscal conservatives are really kind of not in agreement with who their gods are. Um, the religious conservatives consider a just and right God the fiscal conservatives are looking at money as their God. And you put these guys together and these guys are going to come in control of those guys. And these guys are not even going to agree with their religion anymore because they are dependent and, and they prefer to have this relationship with these guys who are not concerned about their religion at all. So I'm just sticking it out there so you guys know where it comes from. And if you feel bad about it, I'm not the problem. You're the problem.